Gunjan Bagla. Based in Los Angeles, Gunjan is the managing director of Amrit Incorporated, a California-based consulting firm focused on helping American companies succeed in India. His clients include Covidian, Roche Diagnostics, Beckton Dickinson, Nordic Naturals, Johnson & Johnson, Gojo, and many more. Gunjan spoke twice at the MDNM West Conference in Anaheim in February this year, and in 2013 was the keynote panel at MedDevice San Diego and MDDI in Ahmedabad, India. Gunjan's work on innovation and in India has been featured in the Harvard Business Review. For his India expertise, Gunjan has ex appeared in various um, media, such as the New York Times, Los Angeles Times, Washington Post, Bloomberg TV, BBC TV, and Fox Business News. He writes about India for the Huffington Post and was quoted twice in Forbes magazine just this week. Gunjan has an MBA from Southern Illinois University and a mechanical engineering degree from the Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur in India. He was also the president of the Alumni Association of the IITs. Rajneesh Rohadgi is based in the New Delhi area in India and has spent over seven years building BD's medical surgical business in South Asia. He has over 25 years of marketing, sales, and leadership experience in India and Africa in the healthcare, medical device, and consumer sectors. This includes a stint as VP of Marketing for Max Healthcare, a leading hospital chain in North India. An among his key accomplishments at BD was pioneering a customer-centric segmentation strategy followed by tight tactical execution to win against low-cost local competitors. At Max Healthcare, Rajneesh developed one of the first branding strategies for a healthcare provider in a market where the only brand had been the physicians themselves. Rajneesh has an MBA from the Indian Institute of Management, Calcutta, which was established by MIT Sloan School, as well as a bachelor's in metallurgical engineering from IIT Kanpur. So now let's move on to Gunjan Bagla. Thank you, Supriya, and welcome to all of you who have joined in from across the U.S., as well as a few folks who are dialing in from various locations in India and Singapore and, and other parts of Asia. I know it's very late for you, and we will try and keep this uh, fast-paced and engaging. I will do part of the presentation, and Rajneesh will, uh, will uh, step in in the middle, and then I'll take over after that. So let's get started. Um, you may have seen this announcement some time ago, or you may have missed it. The Chicago's uh, metro train system decided to place a million dollar order for some automatic, automated external defibrillators, AEDs. And it's nothing remarkable, uh, I, I guess, uh, in the overall scheme of things, unless you notice the small print uh, about the announcement. The company that makes the devices uh, located on the West Coast here in Southern California as well as Seattle, Washington, Cardiac Sciences, is actually now an Indian company. It was purchased by Bangalore-based Opto Circuits for about $64 million uh, about two years ago. And the reason I wanted to make this point to you is really that, you know, we look upon India as a potential emerging market. We look upon India as a source for talent. But there's many more things going on in India. It is, it is an acquirer of, co of companies in the U.S., it is a source of innovation, and there are many reasons why American and European medical device and medical technology companies should be looking at India beyond simply the market reasons. We will, however, today focus on India as a market and also India as a source of engineering talent. And I'm happy to take questions on any aspect of it. And we also have Rajneesh from India who can answer some of these questions. A few months ago, we were struck by this interesting announcement from the largest uh, standalone medical device company, uh, Medtronic. They, ha they have a good business in India, and they launched this program in collaboration with an MIT-based uh, uh, mobile health startup and uh, uh, two hospitals are, uh, in India. And it's really a pilot program. Uh, we hear it's going very well, but the idea was to combine the products from these uh, various entities and run a set of diagnoses across two main locations, one in the northern capital city of New Delhi at Dr. Shroff's Charity Eye Hospital, 
and another in the southern state of uh, Andhra Pradesh at the Health Management Research Institute in Hyderabad. Uh, the idea is to be able to improve the diagnosis and treatments of air inf infections which have, have often gone untreated in India. Uh, and of course, one of the ancillary benefits will be that, uh, that there will be you know, potential patient candidates identified that can benefit from treatments offered by, by modern medicine. So I wanted to give you these two stories just to have a sense of uh, you know what what's happening recently in India. The other big thing that's happening in India tonight actually is that the election results from the 2014 parliamentary elections will be declared, and so you are liable to wake up tomorrow morning and find news on television, radio, and uh, other channels uh, very briefly if, if uh, you know about talking about uh, the changes expected in India's government. Some of those will have potential effects on the medical device market. I am not going to dwell on those today because, again, this is this is really a talk about business rather than politics or international trade. Uh, to give you a sense of where we are coming from, uh, we've got a slide that, that describes what we do. <laughs> Our medical device practice helps Western companies to leverage emerging economies such as India, and we've appeared on you know many uh, well-known media, including. Business Week and Harvard Business Review, but also medical device trade media. I'm not going to dwell further on this slide, uh, so we can get right to business. And really, the presentation is divided into two parts. We're going to talk about selling Western products in India, and we're going to talk about using India's engineering skills for Western markets. Both of these can have nuances that we can get into. Often, Western companies say that, well, to sell a product in a market like India, or China or other emerging countries, I've got to be able to design in that country uh, before I can enter. And we don't feel that that is necessary, although it, is, it may be desirable in the long run. You don't really have to wait for that. You can actually enter these markets today. So let's take a high level look at India. Uh, the, the quest for Western medical device companies is really to reach beyond the billion richest people in the world. And we, we characterize it as reaching the next 3 billion medical consumers. And when you look at these consumers, there are fundamental differences between them and those that inhabit the developed world of Western Europe, Japan, Australia, United States, and Canada. Their wallets are smaller, but it's not just the patient wallets. You have to understand that the doctor's wallets, the hospital's wallets are also smaller. Another big variant, variant I think, is that in the US, we are used to pretty much a third-party payment, and uh, more so in Canada and Europe. This is still not the major decision factor in a country like India in particular, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that when Rajneesh takes over from me. The other important thing to consider is that the cost of labor is much lower, and this has an important bearing when you are, you know, when you are selling a device that you know, where maybe some of your key features have to do with labor savings and repair, labor savings and operation. Uh, if you, you know, I tell, I'll tell my American clients sometimes to look at a market like India and imagine how it would function if the cost of labor were zero or close to zero. Many of the values of the labor saving devices then start to fade away and you've got to talk about other value. There is much value in automation, but it doesn't have to do so much with Labor saving as it may, with accuracy as it may, with dependability, reliability, all kinds of other things can matter. But you've got to view India through that different prism. And this is true for other emerging countries as well. People often view the negative sides of emerging countries, but there, is, there are also many positive sides. Uh, one of them is that the risk of legal liability and the amount of money you need to set aside for malpractice and product liability issues is significantly lower in a country such as India. It is nowhere near as litigious as the United States and certainly nowhere near as litigious as the state of California where I live in. So these are factors that you need to keep in mind. Um, my, my colleague Rajneesh has a great way of uh, describing uh, the difference between India and China. You know, I always like to say India is not China 2.0. It is unique. It is different. And Rajneesh characterizes India as a demand side economy versus China's supply side kind of market. So if you if you go to Shanghai and Beijing, you know they build these magnificent buildings. They build roads before there's traffic to occupy them. India is always the other way around. It's always been a very cash conservative country, and so 
the cars are there before the roads, the airlines and airplanes are there before the airports are ready, and the congested picture you see at the bottom uh, left on this uh, slide is not unusual at all in India where cars have to battle pedestrians and rickshaws and, and, uh, and, and the occasional uh, stray animal as well. Uh, the, the point is that India's needs are driven much more by a tight cash flow situation. The market is growing and you can readily come to the wrong conclusion if you don't look at these things carefully. So one, one thing we do recommend when you are looking at the market in India that it, it is a long term play and to be able to succeed in a big way you've got to reach down into the market and grab market share before domestic Indian companies start rising to the levels and offering service in these areas and start competing with you. Great example of that outside the medical device business is, is the coffee business where Starbucks waited you know, for, for 10 years. They were my favorite uh, uh, whipping boy for a while because they would keep saying they're entering India and then they would pull back. They finally have entered India but in the meantime Cafe Coffee Day and other Indian chains have become formidable and today Starbucks's plans may go up to 50 or 100 stores uh, in, in the entire country. Whereas I think they have 50 stores within 10 miles radius of where I'm sitting here in the Los Angeles area. So India is going to be a small market for them because they waited. So you, you you know, we think the time to enter the Indian market is now. And what I'd like to do now is hand this over to my colleague Rajneesh from New Delhi, India. Rajneesh, would you take over and tell me when you want to change yeah. slide? Good morning, everyone in the audience there. Um, so I'm just waiting for the slide to refresh. Yeah. Yeah, slide uh, seven is up. So it's a relatively, yes, so it's a relatively big, large, but relatively untapped market. Um, 1.2 billion people, large and growing economy. It's already the seventh largest economy in, uh, in FX terms, but as purchasing power parity, it's the third largest. Uh, healthcare is one of the industries which is growing much, much faster than the overall economy, at 12 to 15 percent. And and the fact that more than half the population has not yet begun to access Western-style healthcare and is actually still dependent on the traditional forms of medicine in the villages augurs well for a very, very long period of sustained growth at these high levels. Uh, as these people start coming into uh, through awareness and access into the mainstream western style healthcare. Uh, the device market within this is about four billion dollars and again growing at perhaps excess of 15 percent uh, market and in value terms the foreign companies have a two-thirds share of, of this market. Uh, so it's a fairly open market, uh, it's uh, barring some import licenses, uh, trade is free and companies can plan to bring in a range of product categories, with very few items being perhaps on any negative list of import. Uh, so the key thing here, as Gunjan mentioned earlier, that very large part of the expenses are fully out of pocket. 70% uh, of people's expenses are met out of their own earnings, and that makes the market very, very price sensitive, because people uh, are paying out of their pocket savings of limited monies and limited disposable incomes. Um, private insurance is small but growing, and in another 10 years, it should account for at least 10 to 15 percent uh, of the population getting covered under that. A big part is a game changer at the bottom end of the pyramid is that the government has emerged as a payer. Up till now, the government was seeing itself as a provider of setting up its own hospitals, but they are now getting tenders from insurance companies to cover people below a defined poverty line, and the government pays the premium for that. Uh, so that has opened up a huge amount of market at the bottom end to, uh, for those companies which have their appropriately priced products for that segment. Uh, government is also spent doubling its healthcare spend, so it's woken up late. You know, the first 60 years healthcare of independence, healthcare was a neglected area, and uh, and now government has done a lot in the last five years and continues to do, and plans to increase its share of the expenditure from currently just one one and a half percent of GDP to about two and a half percent of GDP making the overall healthcare spend go up from 5% to perhaps 6, 6.5%. Uh, in the government side, most of the healthcare is a state subject, not a federal subject. So the central government in Delhi, for which the elections have just taken place, do not really make that big a difference on purchase decisions at the state level. Uh, and it's all based on the L1 lowest price tender basis on defined spec. Um, government remains a sensitive issue in terms of how business is done and FCPA concerns are there 
and that makes it imperative for companies not to be able to delegate uh, their action plans in the country down to some distributor only and leave it there. And it's important to have a line of sight and oversight on how he's functioning. Uh, but it is possible to win in this government business and in India without any deviations or violations of FCPA requirement uh, and ethically uh, and, and ethically win those uh, those businesses. Next slide, please. Okay. Next slide is up. Yeah. So here are just two examples of uh, to illustrate the very wide range of uh, variety of companies of different sizes which are coming in. So. It's, uh, on the one hand, you have a reasonable size company out of Sweden, which is one and a half billion dollars global sales. Uh, in the wound care market, it entered just in 2012 uh, and competes with 3M and Kimberley Clark and a range of equipment. But also, along with these two, also competes with one of the very large Indian company uh, whose prices are roughly 30% of 3M's prices. Uh, and that's where they're entering. And they're not a client, and we don't know too much in terms of the financial performance, but what we can make out is fairly well received. The qualitative feedback from hospitals that I've spoken to uh, have, have made a dent in terms of the brand acceptance. On the other end of the spectrum is a company which is relatively new, it's just half a billion uh, sales overall, largely in US and some parts of, uh, of Europe, but has taken the plunge to enter India already. And this is coming out with new innovative technologies in the diagnosis of tuberculosis. And they are doing a pilot in a leading government teaching hospital. And there's some recent reports which have come out, which uh, perhaps uh, it may slow them down a little bit. But it's seen as a great deal of excitement. And Gates Foundation has thrown its weight behind this technology. And it, if if it works in Indian settings, it could be it could revolutionize the whole diagnosis of uh, tuberculosis and particularly multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. So, um, so here is a visual depiction of the two ends of the spectrum of uh, quality and price points that you would get in healthcare providers. On the one hand are the very top end, one of the first corporate chains of hospital that started called Apollo Hospital. And it was started by an Indian doctor for cardiologist who returned to India after working in the US and set this up. Uh, it's the largest one with over 10,000 or 8,000 beds across the country and has set new benchmarks in the quality of care in the country. On the other end are the government provided uh, hospitals which are free of cost to all patients and attracts the really weaker sections of society. And while their clinical and academic credentials are really top notch, but uh, you know, um, this is a kind of hospital where the Prime Minister of India would go if he's unwell. But for the common man, uh, the, the system gets swamped by the sheer volumes and that's their weakness that they're not able to deliver the quality to all the patients in an egalitarian manner. Uh, but in between the spectrum, uh, next slide please, Kinga. In between these two ends, uh, the very size of India. Yeah, the slide is up. So yeah, so, yeah. So, so yeah. So I'm just assuming that others will be able to see it around the same time that I see it, uh, sitting out of your, not in your office. So, um, so between these two ends is a very large uh, number of possible segments, and and the good thing about India's large population is that. Even if there are five or six segments, we are talking of 200, 300 million odd people in each segment, which is perhaps equivalent to one Europe in terms of uh, potential customers and people utilizing those. Uh, so at the top end, if I look, if I classify it as among all the inpatient facilities, uh, there are for the private sector and there's a government sector. And within the private sector, there is this corporate uh, hospitals pioneered by Apollo. And now there's several more which have come in. They account for just 5% of the beds. But they have created a global class in terms of quality, which is available in the country. And a whole set of affluent Indians who would early, earlier go abroad for treatment, no longer actually go out for treatment because it's available here. And in fact, it has started this whole concept of medical tourism, where patients from the Western world or even underserved segments like Africa or Middle East are actually coming in large numbers to these hospitals in India. Some of these rely on as much as 30, 35 percent of their business coming from uh, medical tourism. Uh, and that has proved to be a big quality driver and the international quality has become an imperative for them. Uh, this offers opportunity for really companies to come in with their uh, global range of product and a global pricing and find a ready market there. Uh, just under them are the top hospitals which used to be the best hospitals until these corporate came in. 
and there are about 500 of them which are legacy hospitals, fairly decent but struggling to get up to the same price and quality point as the first category of hospitals. They account for maybe 15% of the beds. The most interesting part and the most challenging part in many ways uh, is this whole estimated 30, 40,000 what we call here nursing homes and that therefore means different from what uh, America calls them the nursing homes. These are just small hospitals. Uh, the range of patients would be similar as a large hospital uh, except for the very high end speciality. And they typically would average around 25 to 30 beds. Uh, many of them in the small, very small towns would be starting out from a GP clinic who gradually starts adding a few beds or a, or a gynecologist uh, who starts adding a few beds and goes into a 20, 25, 30 bed hospital. So it's a one man doctor owned uh, entrepreneur kind of a operation uh, which he runs. Uh, this accounts for 60% of the beds and for product categories which may be correlated to number of beds, uh, therefore 60% of the volumes, so for example syringes or catheters. Uh, and, and there's really the classic example of what CK Prahlad labeled as collectively large but individually small customers. Uh, so companies, most companies and multinationals are sitting at the top end of the market, standing on a glass floor, catering to the bigger hospitals and very tantalizingly looking at this large market under the glass, glass floor and figuring out ways of new business innovation models to be viable in terms of expanding their reach here. And some of what Gunjan is going to talk about later about R&D out of India is perhaps a key part of the strategy to get into some of these segments on the bottom end. On the government side again, there's a range of uh, spectrum of hospitals from the research hospitals down to uh, individual small hospitals at a community level. The interesting part is again a very large number of outpatient doctor clinics uh, which in US I think are called alternate sites. Uh, about a million plus such practitioners of various hues and qualifications. Um, and a very interesting new segment which is coming up which is emerging home care solutions. And several new companies have started up trying to provide services and products for home care. So that's the spectrum that's available. And, and, and the outpatient doctor clinic has a very interesting uh, activities happening around uh, companies experimenting with various point of care opportunities. And that is becoming a big buzzword both in product development terms of mo mobile enabled or very, very small and compact uh, point of care diagnostics which can go into the GP clinic and uh, provide a lot of benefits to the patient and the doctor community. That was a very interesting space. Companies like LR uh, have entered into some of these spaces with rapid diagnostic kits and so on. Uh, so to illustrate uh, this, the whole segment taking one particular product category which is uh, uh, IV catheters, uh, there is a wealthy segment uh, which can afford the 60 cent catheter made by companies like DD and Dron and multinational players, uh, irrespective of whether they are made in India or made outside India where they sell at about 60 cents. Uh, margins are similar to those made in western countries both in percentage and in absolute dollar terms. Uh, but that leaves out a very large segment of the population which was originally with 5 cent wing needle sets which is not the recommended product for long duration infusion but because of affordability people stayed on and used those in a suboptimal manner. Um, can you just click on the entry button? So out of this very large segment there is a segment which is willing to pay a little bit of a premium. They can't go all the way up to 60 cents but they were had affordability for a 20 cent per liter which a host of Indian brands have stepped in in the last 15 years and are manufacturing locally of almost equally good quality as the premium brands. Uh, now these people are therefore seeking a better quality and experience than what a wing needle set provides uh, through an IV catheter but they are unwilling to pay a bigger premium of to what is available today of 60 cents. So the real learning here is that there is a willing and a hidden market niche within this latter segment which we call the spirers and a significant portion of remaining population which is willing to spend more than the base amount but less than what the premium end global class hospitals are using. And that's what can offer an alternative entry strategy for companies which may have a suitable price point but where your existing bigger than you global competitors may have already entrenched themselves in the top tier hospitals. So rather than taking them head on, 
in that segment, you could have an option of actually leapfrogging them and going below them into the top end of tier two. So this is where I hand back to you, Runjan. Yeah, thanks Rajneesh. And what I'd like to do before I move on to the next slide is to find out a little bit more about the audience. So you should see a poll question on your screen asking how much time you have spent in India. Could you take a moment to pick the nearest choice that matches your situation? We'd really appreciate it. And those of you who have already answered the poll, this is also a good time to send any questions that you would like to ask of Rajneesh and myself. We may take some of those during the presentation and we'll certainly stay on at the end to take them at the end of the presentation. I'm going to wait another couple of seconds. I'll close the poll and share the results. It seems like most of you have spent less than 10 days in India and about 15% have spent no time in India at all. Only about 15% of you have spent more than 30 days in India in the last five years. And I do a lot of public speaking about India and this is one characteristic I use to be able to gauge how much you might be in touch with India, the India of today in a business sense. And the criteria I used is if you've spent more than 30 days on business in India in the last five years, then perhaps you might be somewhat in tune with what is happening in India today. So there's only 15% of our audience that has done that. Of course, there's another 8% of the audience, as I mentioned early on, uh, who are calling in from India, perhaps working for Western companies or Indian companies, and they're also curious to find out what we have to say, and we, we, we welcome them, of course. Let me hide that poll, and while we are on the subject, let me run the next question as well to understand how far along you are in your selling process with India. Okay. So the choices are you're considering the idea all the way to you have a joint venture or subsidiary or factory in India. And again, these answers are confidential, so people, other attendees will not see what you're saying. So Priya, are we starting to get any questions yet? Uh, no, we have a quiet audience so far, so I would encourage them to please uh, send us your questions. Uh, we've had a couple of requests for the presentation itself, and I have uh, responded that they can send us an email at the end of the webinar, and uh, uh, you know, uh, you can do the same. Actually, uh, we just got a question in Gunjan. Do you want to take it now or later? Go ahead. Okay, so we have a question from John um, who's asking, uh, critical for us is the possibility of getting regulatory approval for our class two medical device in parallel to regulatory approval in the United States. So they want to get regulatory approval in India at the same time as they're right. getting a FDA approval in the US? That's, that's what seems to be the question? Yes. Yeah. So the regulatory regime in India, and we could actually give a whole separate presentation on it, is uh, you know perhaps is you know has has some gaps in it drugs and devices are regulated under the same rule and there has been much talk about creating new regulation that would affect devices only the bill has been before parliament uh, but they did not finally approve it uh, in this last parliament hopefully it will come up for uh, for uh, a review with the new parliament being formed as of uh, next week uh, but it may not happen, you know, it may not be at the, the, at the top of their list. Uh, at, at, current, at the current time, about 10 categories of medical devices have specific regulations around them. And it seems to be a little bit of a free-for-all for the other categories. Uh, Rajneesh, do you want to add something to that briefly? No, sir, I think you capture the key points here. Um, so, however, for the other categories for getting import license, uh, they do give a lot of weightage to if you've got either US FDA approval or EU or CE marking or Australian or a Japanese FDA approval. So any of those ones then makes it relatively easier uh, to get the Indian import license registration. Exactly, and I think that's an important point to keep in mind. This actually is a competitive advantage for foreign companies today because if, in, if an Indian company develops a product, to sell in the Indian market. They face some of those same barriers and it's very uneconomical for an Indian company to want to get a CE approval in Europe or a, or a um, FDA approval in the US if that's not their primary market. So in a sense, for now, foreign companies have some advantage uh, with, you know, over their Indian competitors. Let me close the poll that we ran and share it. And looks like we have a fairly wide range 
in the audience. So a third of you are just considering the idea. And then more than a third of you have limited sales in India and uh, plans to grow. We often get contacted by this segment where they've launched something in India and perhaps the sales growth has not met the corporate expectations. And uh, you know, uh, Rajneesh and I and our team in India are experts at, at helping people come out of this mode into, into a more successful uh, kind of operation in India. A lot of it has to do with the fact that India is not China, China 2.0. Uh, Rajneesh, you want to add to that? No, I just uh, I don't know whether you can solicit that uh, for the clarification. I'm just curious that those 38 percent of limited sales, how many of them have it through an importer, distributor only, and without a legal entity of the company, and how how many of them is have actually set up a legal entity? Yeah, I don't know that we have a poll question yeah, on that at this yeah. point. Okay, just that okay. Rajneesh. We can follow up with them later. Okay, yeah. so let me close that poll and return to our slides. Uh, you heard in the in the uh, intro how re, re, big big part of Rajneesh's career has been looking at creative market segmentation, and I think that's one of the key determinants of success in India. And here we have a very simple illustration: if you are going to be mining for medtech med sales and treasures in India, so if you're introducing a brand new concept in India, you know, such as uh, robotic surgery, and there's nobody in India a Western company or a domestic company offering that, then clearly, you know, you, you would start with the concept of concept selling and education. But just as important in India, and probably more so than other countries, is the absolute need to provide on, on, on the ground service and support of the products that you might sell. So you might have this million dollar device that does all kinds of wonderful things, but many Indian hospitals and customers will hesitate to buy it unless you can prove to them that you are going to provide on the ground support and it's going to stick for a while. So this is, this is a category that uh, many, many Western companies really enter at this level because they see a, a particular disease opportunity or a particular medical condition opportunity that is unique in India. They have a, this great solution. Uh, but there are many steps between having a good product and having substantial sales in India. Uh, the other two categories I think are very important to understand because we think that there is significant revenue possibilities. So if you have a product that is a significant improvement over the existing players, whether they are multinational foreign companies playing in India, whether they are Indian companies, or whether it's some traditional solution. So for example, it may be a product that improves the safety for the patient, you know, perhaps, you know, such as the catheters you saw in the previous slides. Perhaps it's something that improves the safety for nurses and providers. Um, the way that you want to approach that kind of market and the way that we can help you build it is look at both uh, building a substantial volume share as well as a value share because this your product will be at a premium price, but it will provide premium value. So maybe the patient experience is, is higher, maybe the provider experience is better, maybe it is the improved patient outcomes, but you then attach a value to that and if you, if you can successfully do that, uh, we are here to tell you that the Indian consumer, the Indian hospitals, despite their price sensitivity, if you can demonstrate to them that these factors are true, that they will pay a premium. Okay. Finally, what if you just have a me too product? You know, many companies say, well, it's too, India is too far away a market to enter. You know, if, if I have, you know, if I'm not offering something that's substantially better. Well, in some cases that may be true, but in many cases we think that if you are, if you have a nimble strategy, if you know how to execute, you can get into India and you can grab or seize your fair share in that market. All boats are rising in India. You've heard how the government spend is going up. you heard how uh, the private hospitals and chains are rising. So if you can craft a strategy that can further segment the competitors and create a niche for yourself, you can absolutely succeed even in a me too type of situation. And, uh, and then if, if some of you are in that category, uh, in, the, in that kind of situation, we'd love to talk to you further about it. This is again just a very high level view of you know, the kind of opportunities you might find in India. So what about distribution? We often get asked, you know, I, I'd say about half our initial inquiries from people who are not present in India start with, hey, 
please just help me select a distributor among the dozen or two, two dozen companies that have sent emails to me on my website. And, and we have to go through an education process to describe to our potential clients in, in, in the US or in Europe that most of the people who have contacted you by email are probably not the right ones you should be talking to at all. The reason for that is that India's distribution system is quite fragmented. Most of the companies are really very small, mom and pop, owner driven types of companies. They may operate in one city, they may have one or two very strong relationships, uh, but they don't really have national reach. So what, what you and I expect in terms of a distributor that has an ERP system and a national sales force, that really doesn't exist for the most part in India. There are some distributors who will claim to be national, but typically they are working with affiliate companies belonging to relatives or companies that they have some weak alignments with. And, and, and so we really think of those as sub-distributors. Most of the channel consists of people who can do very limited value-added selling. So the selling and the branding really is, continues to be the responsibility of the OEM for the most part. Many of these distributors will sell multiple brands including your competition's brand. And so they don't have a strong reason to make a case for your product unless it gets them better margins. And that's, you know, that, that becomes a tough battle for you because there's price pressure, there's margin pressure, and it's hard for you to get visibility to the end, end client. So we think India often, you know, you do need distributors, but it requires a little bit of a different approach, which I will get to in the next slide. Uh, there are many concerns with some of these thinly capitalized distributors. Some of them uh, selling products from Indian companies are used to methods that most American companies would consider unethical, and certainly many would, would, would use methods that would be in violation of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Uh, many of them, for this reason, ask for very high markups. And it's not that they're keeping all of that profit for themselves, that, that, that high markup is actually going to line the pockets of some purchasing agent. That's not the kind of business most or any American company that we know of would want to indulge in and, and not something that we recommend or support. Uh, there's also an issue with the smaller distributors that you end up with some, some degree of cross-channel conflict where a Delhi distributor will try to muscle in on a, on, a, on a sale in Mumbai, particularly now with these growing chains and it creates you know, some degree of distress for a foreign company who's not quite aware of these nuances of things that are happening in India. So we do have a creative solution that sometimes works. It's not a one size fits all, uh, but what we often do for, for our clients who are struggling with this question of distribution is that we serve as India domain experts providing uh, essentially a translational interface between our Western clients and the ecosystem in India. So we become the guardian of your ethics and your compliance and your business culture and offer some of the services of your marketing and sales department in a, in a method where, again, we are loyal to you. We are not loyal to the distributor or the end customer. And it, it enables you to have a stepping stone for a year, two years, or five years as you are building out the market in India uh, before you can hire a full-time sales force of your own and create a subsidiary. So it gives you a method to step into the Indian market. Uh, the same method could work in other, other economies, but we, you know, we are primarily focused on making this happen in India. And again, this is just one solution. I don't want to say that this is the only one, and for some companies this may not be the right one. Alrighty, so let's run one more poll. We are running a little bit behind compared to our typical webinars. Let's just ask, what is your biggest worry when you think about India business? If you can take a moment to share that with us, it would be handy. Uh, Gunja, we also have a couple of questions, if you want to take it now or later. Sure, let's take them now. Okay, so we have a question from Susan, who's asking, how important is it to use a dealer versus direct sales force? Uh, yes, that's a great question. Uh, generally, a direct sales force implies a larger investment in India and it implies a greater commitment. So it is something that is doable for many people. For many people the product is complex enough that that's the only way to sell it and then you have to determine whether you put in a national sales force in place, whether you fly people in from you know Singapore, Shanghai or Boston or, or Silicon Valley uh, or whether you hire a full full blown sales team in India. Uh, sometimes you know we generally recommend for most people to take a low risk approach and go step by step. So 
So we might recommend that you approach just one or two segments first. Whether dealers and distributors will should be your primary entry point, I think again depends on the nature of the product, the nature of the competition, and some of the concerns that we have talked about in the last couple of slides around uh, the way the channel in India works. What you can't do is expect to duplicate a solution that works in another country in India. We often get asked, you know, at, when I speak at these medical conferences, people ask me, well, when will India be dot, 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 whatever it is, be ready for this, be ready for that, change into this, change into that. And my typical response is, you know, India is not going to change to suit the needs of your company. You have to look at the market the way it is and then find the right niche, the right approach to enter the market. There are plenty of opportunities in India for virtually every company in, you know, on the phone today. I'd say 90% of the people who approach us would be able to find some way to do business in India. There are about 10% for, for whom we tell them right up on the phone, first phone call that India is not right for you. Either they're too early or too late. And, uh, and that's fine. You know, we'd rather not uh, take somebody down a path where they're not going to succeed. But yeah, so to answer, answer her question, I think it's, it's uh, you know, either could be the right answer. If you're going to go with your own sales force, you really got to think hard whether it's going to it's going to be worthwhile. Uh, we are occasionally approached by people who had their own sales force and the sales force left, and now they are suddenly you know in the lurch. So you don't want that to happen to the extent possible. Uh, let's uh, close. Then this can report. I please Sorry. go ahead. So just to nuance that answer of yours a little bit, uh, in some cases. I think a dealer or a direct sales force may not be an either or, and you might actually need both. As we said earlier, a dealer or a distributor typically has not yet evolved to take on demand creation work. And he's basically a fulfiller of existing demand. And therefore, you need a team which can create demand, which is a direct sales team. Now, by direct, it need not imply that they have to be on your payroll. And that fits in into the solution which Gunjan presented in the previous slide that if you have a partner which becomes your interface, uh, for example, Amrit or other other such organizations that might be there, uh, then you have your quote unquote your direct sales team, but not really on your payrolls. Yeah, thank you, Rajneesh, for 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 that texture and clarification. That's great. All right, so you should be seeing on your screen the results of this last poll. And uh, looks like most of you are concerned about pricing policy in India. And, and, and we think that, that that's definitely a valid question, something we'd love to work with you on, uh, should, you, should you decide that you want to some, pursue something beyond this webinar. Some of you are concerned about reaching the right potential customers. And given the complexity of India with 26 languages and uh, uh, you know, so many different subcultures, the very Structured, you know, nature of the complex nature of the market. I think that's a valid concern. I tell people often that when you think about India as a as a market, think about it almost as a continent. You know, how do you approach Europe? Your approach in Denmark is likely to be very different from your approach in Greece or the UK versus the the Czech Republic is going to be very different. So yeah, reaching the right potential customers, I think, can be a challenge. Also. Avoiding reaching the wrong customers is just as much of a challenge. And sometimes your channel will bring you people whom, who may not be the right customers for you. And then you spend a lot of effort chasing those opportunities and they don't go anywhere. So that's something you have to watch for. As far as the difficulty of travel and staying healthy and so on, that's something that we as experts at. I'm heading to India again for the second time this year, next week. And we are taking one of our East Coast clients with us. and. One of their top executives is very much concerned about this. But we, we think that India is a fairly safe country to travel if you follow some of our simple and straightforward guidelines that uh, you, know, you, you will have a good and productive experience in, in, in engaging with India in that manner. So let me close this. And uh, I'm going to pick up the pace as we talk about the next section. Uh, there are some technical people engineering R&D people on the webinar. I want to do them some justice. Uh, the engineers in India are providing extremely valuable help to some of the leaders in the engineering, in, in the medical device business. I've got some examples here. Uh, the, the work that GE is doing with the Jack Welch Center in, in Bangalore with over 5,000 people, 
uh, Philips has operations in in Bangalore and other uh, countries, other uh, cities as well. Siemens has produced uh, cameras uh, uh, and imaging devices in their fa facilities in Goa. And on the slide here, you have a picture of the Lullaby Baby Warmer that was designed in India and is now being sold in Western Europe uh, quite successfully. It, you know, it's much lower price than the, the other solutions that existed, but it's also a capable uh, product. The other approach that works well in India is to use some of the external engineering service providers. And these are companies that typically are external engineering R&D design companies, not your IT outsourcers. These people are specialists in product design, in sustaining engineering, in, so, in software verification and testing. I have visited facilities that have very sophisticated labs to perform all the kinds of tests that you might need to do uh, in the West, and they can do them right in India. Uh, there, there, there was quite a vibrant market for clinical trials in India, although the last couple of years that has slowed down with some issues that came about in the government. We think that they will get resolved soon. So there are many, many ways in which you can benefit from Indian labor. Many people see this as a cost-driven play, but we don't. We think it's really a capacity and capability-driven play. Most, most CEOs of medical device companies tell us that if they could double their engineering capacity, they would have a big impact on sales. Well, engineers from India permit you to double your engineering capacity without doubling your engineering budget. And so that allows you to sell into niches and markets that you might not otherwise uh, otherwise have taken up. And often what we do is we we'll sit down with the chief technology officer or the head of engineering for a business unit at a med tech company, look at all their projects, A, B, C, D, E, look at the various phases of the projects and check off the things that we think can be performed offshore. Could be by off offshore within their own engineering team in, in, in a city like Bangor, Hyderabad, or Delhi, or it could be offshore and outsourced by a third party. Uh, these capabilities have gotten quite sophisticated in recent years. And uh, we have, you know, we did a project for somebody where the entire product was going to be designed in India. Uh, they had the overall product specs, and then everything was is, is, is to be done in India. We have also had cases where products have been designed in India to be sold into the China market and then ultimately make their way back into other emerging countries. All of these are now possible. There's a couple of quick examples. We are running out of time, so I will go through this quickly. And of course, the slides are available to anybody who wants to review them in detail. So in this particular case, we went with a extension of the R&D team. The idea was that their, their key engineers in the US were being constantly bogged down by working on legacy products. And they, didn't, they couldn't be released to work on breakthrough new innovations you know, in, in the US facility. So what we said was, let's set up a capable entity and let us have them take some of the non-core components. Let's also have them do the refresh and the sustaining engineering for the legacy product. And so they started out by building a captive engineering center. We looked at a number of locations, uh, uh, primarily in China. And they already had some operations in Japan. So we looked at the possibility of expanding those. But the client rapidly narrowed this down to India in this particular case. Uh, we did a very detailed analysis uh, about uh, locations in Bangalore, in Hyderabad, in Chennai. And then came out with a recommendation for them to set up an engineering center in one of those cities. I'm not at liberty to say which one. The intent was to do all of the work in a captive mode where their employees you know, would be doing all of the work. But in about six or months or a year into it, we realized that we could expand capacity much more rapidly by then adding an outsourced layer, a shell around the core captive capabilities of the, uh, of the India engineering center. And that combination has worked very well for them over a number of years. Let me talk about another example. In this particular case, they wanted to maintain resource flexibility. And they were really looking for, uh, for uh, outsourced resources to start with. Uh, and, and then the uh, captive came later. The drive here, yes, was you know definitely a cost arbitrage was a good part of it. But really, it was more about flexibility. They were making some big bets in terms of new product introductions. And they didn't want to be stuck with a large engineering team 
in specialties that they didn't have any other use for if those bets failed. So they were able to reduce the risk. They were able to hire the skills faster by, by time sharing essentially with the outsourced Indian team. And this worked out better. As they gained confidence, they were then able to go back and build some of the in-house capability over a period of time. So their, their captive R&D center is much smaller and it came much later in their evolution. Uh, I won't dwell very much on this slide, but basically we, we look at the investment in time and cost that the company should make on the x-axis. On the y-axis, we look at the degree that you want to harness local innovation. By local, I mean innovation in India. And then there are various models that can work. You know, most people think first about this captive R&D center, but we think that there are many other options that require a much less of a financial risk and commitment for a typical West End company. So let me stop there uh, and repeat a few things here. Uh, uh, you, if you want a copy of the slides, uh, you can send an email to usa at amrit.com and we will send them to you. We are also recording this webinar and we will make the recording available to anybody who's interested. Again, send us an email if you want to uh, listen to the recording or share it with, uh, with some of your colleagues who were unable to attend. Some time ago, we wrote a research report on the medical device market in India, and typically we sell that. But for those who have attended this webinar, and attendees only, uh, if you send us an email saying, I attended the webinar and I'd like a copy of that report, we'll make it available to you at no charge. And there's, there's some, other, some other work that we've done for the HBR and so on that we can also make available to you. Um, uh, Supriya, are there questions? Yes, we have a couple of questions. And again, I would like to encourage the attendees. This is sort of the, now the last call for questions um, um, as we dive into the ones that I've already received. So feel free to send us. Um, Gunjan, we have a, a couple of questions, I think, that came up because of your uh, the R&D segment. Uh, SK uh, would like to know more about R&D from the perspective of doing R&D for Indian companies and R&D consulting companies. R&D for Indian companies? Yes. OK. So that, you know, we really didn't cover that at all in this, in this webinar. But uh, I, I think there is definitely a case today. Some of the Indian medical device companies, and again, I'm going to limit myself to medical device and medical technology companies. Some of them have been funded by Western VCs. Some of them have grown out of engineers who used to work for GE, Philips, or Siemens or other companies and then have set up their own operations. A few have grown out of, you know, uh, out of visionary young entrepreneurs in their 20s and have been able to build you know, a substantial business. By Western standards, most of these companies are still fairly small, but some of them are looking for breakthroughs. And uh, you know, while they are able to do routine design and perhaps uh, software-related work very effectively, I think that there may be a need in some of those companies to be able to utilize the skills of a highly talented Western medical uh, medical device engineer, biomed engineer, or a small team uh, of, of, of such people to be able to then perhaps address problems that are unique in the Indian ecosystem. So I can certainly see a place for that. I can't think of any examples where that has happened recently other than uh, some young entrepreneurs from the US who moved to India. So they really, again, weren't looking to outsource their services in any manner. But I think um, Rajneesh can probably talk about Embrace Innovations run by the young, uh, young woman from Stanford. Uh, that's not exactly an answer to, to this question. Uh, but uh, very briefly, uh, Rajneesh, can you mention something about Embrace in a sentence or two? Yeah, so this is a team out of the Stanford Biodesign program, and they came up with the solution for a very, very low-cost idea for keeping uh, uh, underweight babies at, a, at the right temperature, and which is one of the contributors to the uh, to the large uh, challenge of infant mortality in, in underserved countries. The, the incubators available traditionally have been very expensive, and once they conk off and they don't work, then there's, uh, there's lack of maintenance in the remote areas near the villages, even if they had originally been able to afford it, and therefore they're not functioning. And uh, they came up with a with a non, uh, it's really not an equipment, it's like a sleeping bag with a, with a kind of a wax which they developed 
which whose latent heat characteristics are such that it retains the same temperature at body body weight body temperature for about six to seven hours, uh, and the baby is really uh, wrapped up in that. Uh, so they they chose to launch in India. It is a product which came out. One of the partners uh, and one of the team members was from IIT Chennai, and we were studying in Stanford. And they decided to launch in India. And they've been at it for about a year and a half or two years uh, in terms of being in the market. And uh, and they are looking at alliances with GE and others uh, and trying to sell to the government of India, which is very very actively concerned about the high rate of infant mortality in India. Excellent. Thanks, Tish. What else do we have, uh, Supriya? Uh, uh, we have a question from Anmol, I think based on the couple of slides uh, that before. Um, he's asking for examples of external engineering service providers that you mentioned. Right. So uh, in this webinar, we really aren't at liberty to disclose particular names of external service providers. Uh, I can say, generally speaking, the early folks who did this were the large IT service companies. But then what has happened since then, and the place where we've been most active, is looking at companies that that make it their primary mission to serve the chief technology officer rather than the chief information officer. And those companies we find tend to hire engineers that have longer track records of experience. They develop product product development skills. They, they have more loyalty to the company, lower turnover than the IT service companies. And we find that uh, that those work out very well. At the other end of the spectrum are really tiny companies, a number of companies really run by young entrepreneurs who are very motivated to do product design. Maybe they have an idea or two of their own, and it's taking you know years for them to take it to market. In the meantime, they also offer services in, in you know in terms of their innovative skills to be able to develop products for third parties. Uh, and typically, these are companies with less than 20 or 30 employees in you know, their boutiques or studios. And we've had some, some breakthrough work come out of these companies, uh, helping very, very large clients overseas. So uh, in one particular case, uh, I personally took the CTO of a, of a very substantial uh, uh, company whose name we did not mention in, in the beginning of the presentation. but. We took them to the to the big you know big uh, Wipros and TCSs and so on, uh, but we also took them to some small companies and all of the deals they did were with companies with less than 20 employees and some of them have the potential to be transformative. No yeah. products have come out of that initiative yet uh, because this company takes you know as is common in the medical device business it takes you know five to six years before a product before a concept becomes a product in the market, but the progress that we've seen has been remarkable. And again, this is not, not a cost-driven play. This is really a play on getting innovative thinking out of India. OK, great. Um, thanks, Gunjan. And we have one last question from Susan, um, who is mainly uh, interested in finding out more about the plastic surgery market in India, um, whether the plastic aesthetic surgery is growing, um, and uh, you know how big is the market, I guess. Yeah, so I assume we're talking about plastic cosmetic surgery not reconstructive in you know as a result of accidents or disasters uh, well, actually, she does it. mention uh, uh, reconstruction as well so i see okay yeah. rajneesh do you have some thoughts on that uh, i want to give you a qualitative answer because i've never been very familiar with that, uh, with that industry and don't have numbers but certainly both both ends of that uh, thing both the cosmetic as well as the reconstructive i do know are growing very rapidly one of the large uh, users, uh, one of the large percentage of uh, medical tourists who come into India are actually for a lot of those surgeries. Um, and, and therefore, all I can qualitatively say that it is a rapidly growing piece, but I have no personal uh, information or expertise of knowing in terms of market size. Yeah, what I've, what I've seen has been focused really on the largest cities, Delhi, Mumbai, Bangalore, and you know much of it has been focused on on both, uh, you know, addressing the highest the highest echelons of the Indian uh, consumer pyramid, as well as a fair degree of medical tourism. In fact, one of my local friends here is a plastic surgeon who flies to India once a quarter to conduct plastic surgery, primarily on Middle Eastern women who come to India to get the work done. So right. it was an interesting subsegment. So <laughs> Dental-related, face-related, reconstruction, cosmetic, 
Uh, one hears a lot of it. There are lots of standalone centers opening up. Uh, I'm not sure about the quality of all of them, but uh, yeah, there's a general buzz about that whole space, and therefore, very layman's answer that yes, I think it's a rapidly growing space. Yeah. And then, so if you send us an email Friday, with, so with even, something more specific, we can probably delve into this a little bit deeper, yeah. and I would ho offer that to to others on the call as well who may have similar, very specific questions that don't apply to the general audience. You know, we are happy to you know to dig a little bit for you. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Gunjan, and uh, thank you, Rajneesh. We are running over time, so any other questions we have, we will answer via email. Um, I just want to thank everyone for attending the webinar today. We hope it was informative. If you have any additional questions, please feel free to email us at usa at amrit.com. Please make sure as you exit the webinar that you fill a brief survey that we present you. We would really appreciate your feedback. If you have any friends or colleagues that you think might benefit from a similar webinar, please do have them register on our website, www.amrit.com, and we will notify them of any upcoming webinars. Thank you all very much for attending today, and have a nice day. Goodbye.